warn us? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. If you can't hear me at any time, let me know. Okay. And I would also ask him if you speak loudly enough for the individual to hear you. Okay. Can you, you might need to come a little closer to the microphone if you can. Okay. Okay. How old are you? 35. Uh, where are you from? Troy, Michigan. When did you leave home or come to Florida? Uh, around 14 years old. Okay. Where had you been living just prior when you were 14 years old and you decided to come to Florida? I was living in Troy, Michigan. Okay. With your family? Yes. Uh, why did you come to Florida? Because when I was younger and I was living out in the streets, I was sleeping in the snow and all. It was too cold, and I had to come to Florida where it was warmer weather and seek warmer shelter. Okay. How did you come to Florida? I hitchhiked. And did you come with a friend, or how did you come? By myself. How did you support yourself during those early years? Well, I had a couple jobs for 75 cents an hour, but I basically was a prostitute. Okay. Well, when did you start becoming a prostitute, Lee? At the age of 16. Okay. And how did that happen? How did you end up getting into that particular profession? Well, there was a... When I was hitchhiking, a lot of guys would pick me up and they'd ask me if I wanted to make some money. And they'd give me like $60 or $100, and back in them days, a $2, you could get a $2 meal for, you know, I mean, a cheap meal. So it was really good money. I was only making 75 cents an hour, and it was excellent money to help me because I was on the road. And so I took the offer, and that's where I became a hitchhiking prostitute. Were you always in Florida doing that? Were you all no, I was all over the United States. Okay. And how old were you when you finally came to, to Florida to settle? Do you remember? So yes, I was old. about... Um, well, I was 16 when I came to Florida. Mm -hmm. But I mean, to settle, to just settle, mm -hmm. I was about 20. Okay. Have you ever had children? Yes, I have one son. And how old were you then? He should be about 21 or how 22. Old were you when you had? Oh, I was uh, 14. Okay. And did you give the child up or what happened? Yeah, you're on your own. Better ask the question. Uh, my grandmother made me give the child up. My parents, my grandmother and grandfather. You, you thought of your grandparents as your parents? Yes, they adopted me. How often over the last few years, let's start four or five years ago, how often would you go out during the week to, to hustle on the highways? Just previously? Let's say the last four or five years. Well, I would go out to about anywhere from three to three to seven days. It depended. It basically four days out of week for sure. Okay. And how many men would you say you have contact with during the course of the day? Hmm. I would say I had at least anywhere from three to eight. It depended. It varied. But definitely three a day at least. I mean, but it varied. I could have six. I could have eight. And not all of those contacts, or, or were all of those contacts sexual? Yes, those are sexual contact. Okay. And uh, did you have contacts with men on the road that weren't sexual? Oh, or yeah. Just a lot? Every day, at least, at least 8 to 15, because I worked from exit to exit. Okay, explain that. You worked from exit to exit. Well, uh, I would leave Daytona. And there's times I'd spend the whole day on the road or, or the whole night, and I'd stay two or three days gone. And I just worked from one exit to the other. If a guy would pick me up and he wasn't interested, now so a lot of guys asked me too. I didn't have to ask them. Okay. And if they were interested, fine. But if they weren't, I'd just get off the next exit and try again. Okay. Uh, 
there came a time when you met Ty, Tyra Moore. Mm -hmm. When was that? 1986. And describe the relationship with Ty. Well, um, I met her at the Zodiac, and from the very first day I met her, we fell head over heels with each other, and uh, at the first year, we were pretty, you know, kind of sexual, but we, the second year and the third year and on, we became like sisters, and I loved her very deeply. She loved me very deeply, but we didn't care about the sex part anymore. We just cared about each other. We were really, really, really close, like a knot, like a, tied like a rope, like a knot of rope. Uh, did your, uh, I'm going to call it hustling because that's what you call it. Your hustling uh, stop once you got into the relationship with Ty? No, she, matter of fact, she quit her job at Al Kareeb. Uh, the, the first month that I was with her, she quit her job because I told her I make $150 a day or better, and you only make $150 a week. So if you want to quit, I'll support you. And she was all for it, and she continued to support me like a cheerleader. She wanted me out there. She told me all the time to go out and make more money. Did you begin to go out more often? Did there come a time you started well, going out more often? The last year, she didn't like the trailer living, and she just constantly was telling me that I wasn't providing enough for her that she wanted me to go out there and make more money because she wanted me to get a pressure cleaner business again and also get a house for her and everything else. So she said, I want you to go out there more often. She was pretty much like my pimp, it seemed like I was a white slave. I didn't realize it, but she'd tell me to go on out there. If I didn't, she was going to break up with me and find another girl that would definitely take care of her. And I loved her to the max, and I wasn't going to do that. Did you talk about your experiences on the road with her? Um, not really. Why not? She, she didn't want to hear it. She'd never, she always told me not to talk to her about it. She didn't care what happened to me out there. Did you try to talk to her about Richard Mallory? Yeah. I did, but she didn't want to listen. Uh, and during the times that you were uh, with Ty, did she ever work? Uh, Tyra worked when I first met her, Al Kareeb, then she quit a month. I took care of her, and then she worked for a couple times at Sepper Motels, I mean, Sepper Hills Motel, but she didn't get any money. That was for board, so I took care of her there. The only solid job she ever had, maybe, she was a laundry worker for two months, and that didn't work long, so forget that. Uh, so the only solid job she had was uh, Castle Del Mar the last year. She was making like about 300 every two weeks. Okay. Or 277, something like that. And was she working when the two split up? No. Did, had she quit her job? She got fired. Do you know why? And she beat up her boss. So during these periods of time, were you supporting her? Uh, yes. What, what were you spending your money on? Oh, wow. Well, see, I wanted to save up for, like, a house and a pressure cleaner and everything else. And every time I came home with money, she always wanted to go to the mall and buy clothes. I never bought clothes for myself. I, don't, I had a bra even that had Band-Aids on it and safety pin and everything. I mean, I never could. I, always, I just took care of her. I didn't really seem to want to care about myself. I just took care of my, her and bought her a lot of clothes and everything. And a lot of times she'd just go to the bars and we'd go to fancy restaurants and bars and we blew it all in basically bars. I mean, $100, I saw her spend three, $200 in a quarter machine for stuffed, stuffed animals in one night, just on um, quarters in the machine. She, she, whatever she wanted, she got it. I, I loved her very much. Did you like to drink too? Yes, I drank. Mm -hmm. Did you drink a lot? Just as much as her. We always kept even. We always made sure we were drinking the same amount so one wouldn't have more than the other. We, we, that's how close we were. We, we did everything together. 
would you drink when you were out on the road working? Yeah, I drank about, I'd say anywhere from two to six beers, sometimes more, sometimes less. Why would you drink out on the road? Well, it was like my tranquilizer. I was shy and hard to sometimes, I was just shy. I was embarrassed about my body because I had a whipped Wow. I was just shy, and it, it was my tranquilizer, and plus I was scared out there sometimes. I was nervous, and but I knew that that was my profession. It's the only thing I could do, so. Did you accept rides with men of all ages? Yes, I did. It, yeah, but, but the young guys I decided not to deal with because I've learned throughout time that they were always high, they were always stoned on or something and and they just seemed a little more <coughs> aggressive and like a violent attitude or something i don't i didn't trust them and they always were stoned or something and i don't do drugs so prior to uh meeting richard mallory had you ever been hurt while you were out working on the road yes can you tell us about that <coughs> Well, I had, twice I had uh, mace guns, and they got those away from me and beat me up pretty bad and raped me, and then I had this bullfighter mace that a friend of mine gave me. Objection, and, Your Honor, to the question not specifying some kind of time frame or time reference. Uh, later, right? Okay. Yeah. Within the last five years, starting with the first time, within the last five years, we'll go back later, uh, if you would tell the jury about any instances and where you were living when these occurred. Okay. Um, I was living with Tyra and, and Oleander, and it was... Do you want the year or something? If, if you recall the year. Yes, it was in 86 and 87 and 88. Okay. And um, also there was a couple of guys that raped me without any weapon, and I got hurt on that. Okay. Okay. When you were a young girl, just starting out, were you ever physically hurt while you were out on the road? And if, if you were, again, tell us where you were and how old you were. Okay, I was hurt a couple of times. Um, there was this guy in Jeffersonville, Indiana. He was a third degree karate and judo, and judo instructor and a school seventh grade school teacher. And I met him in a lounge and um, he beat me up so bad he, you couldn't describe my face. And I got away from him when I finally got help and the police arrived. They told me that he, he raped a police officer's daughter and disfigured her face so bad you couldn't describe it. And that he killed two teenagers and they were in the backyard of his house buried in cement. I was lucky. I got away, and it took me about, well, I did a report and everything, and but I don't know what happened. If they were just beating him up with flashlights and everything else and told me not to say anything. What, I was beat up. It took me about two months to recover. I still had yellow and purple and everything on my face. Why didn't you quit working the roads after you've been hurt? Because it was my only... The way I could, well, see, like, I tried to get churches to help me, and they told me I had to be a part of the congregation, and they wouldn't help me. And I tried to be a police officer when I was 20 years old. They told me I had to have $3,000 for tuition, and um, that, uh, then they'd send me to some academy or something like that. I didn't have my GED. Then I tried to be a correctional officer here in Daytona, and they told me I had to have a car. I didn't have a car. I only had a bicycle. Um... Then I tried the Salvation Army. They told me I can only crash at their place for one day out of every 364 years. You can only stay one night. And I tried and tried and tried to help myself. I joined, I 
took the aptitude barrier test for the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines, and I missed by three to five points every time. And I thought that would help me get off the road by just going into the government military field, and I didn't pass. That took me two years because you got to wait six months every time to take the aptitude battery test. And so the only thing I, had, I could do was be a prostitute and live off of... It, I lived here and there and everywhere. But I had apartments at one time, but then I lost them and stuff. And do you remember catching a ride with Richard Mallory? Uh, yes. If you remember, when did you meet him? It was at the end of November. Of what year? 1989. Okay. Where were you when you first met Richard Mallory? I was on I-4 underneath an I-75 I over the pass. Okay. And describe the first meeting that you had with him. Well, I was coming from Fort Myers. I had spent a couple nights there. The second night, <clears throat> I left Fort Myers. I left about 5.30, 6 o'clock. And it took me about six rides to get to I-4. I finally arrived at I-4. It was raining. So I walked off. I mean, yeah, I walked to I down the ramp to I-4. It was raining. So I got underneath the bridge, and it was... Wait, I was waiting for it to stop raining, and I was pretty much off into the, where the Vidoc, I think you call her, with that slab of cement. I was uh, right under there, away from the vehicles, because when they were passing, it was spraying uh, rain all over me. So I was over there waiting for it to stop raining. Then uh, it slowed down, and I decided I was going to walk toward the light. There was a big light out there. I was going to walk under it so they could tell, you know, what if I was a girl or a guy or, you know, what I was. And as I started to walk, a vehicle pulled over before I even get, got past the bridge. And then it start, its lights came on and started backing toward me. And it, I didn't know if it was a bunch of guys in a car or what, but anyway, a car, a vehicle passed. And its headlights went on in the vehicle, and I saw one head. So I felt all right, walked up to the car. I opened the door and I said, did, did you stop for me? And he said, yeah. Are, are you going to Orlando? I said, no, I'm going to Daytona. He said, oh, wow, you're a lucky day, man, because I'm going all the way to Daytona. I said, oh, wow, this is great. So I got in the car and we proceeded down the road. Let me ask you something, Lee. At this time, the time that you met um, Richard Mallory, had you started carrying a gun? I carried the gun six months before, at least, or four months. Some I can't really recall when, but it was in Rutland when I got the, the pistol. Okay. And why were you carrying the gun? For strictly protection. If you will, describe your uh, your trip with Ms., uh, Mr. Mallory from the time he picked you up until, let's say, for Orlando. Okay. <clears throat> All right, when you mean when he picked me up and now we're going down the road. Okay. Uh, just, if you will, were you having a conversation with him? Yes. Okay. Can you tell us about that? All right. So when he picked me up, he asked me... You know, where I saw Tom Daytona, I was really glad and everything. We started down the road. He asked me if I wanted to drink. He, he had some kind of, I didn't know what it was. I just saw tox, tonic bottles, and then I thought it said Smirnoff. I'm not sure. And he asked me if I wanted to drink. And um, and then I asked him, I said, well, what is it? And he says, vodka. So I said, oh, all right. And I think he had orange juice. And I said, sure, I'll take a drink, you know. So he made he pulled over and he made me a drink and then we started back on the road and then he asked me if I wanted to smoke some marijuana I said no I, my hands swell feet swell my heart beats a mile a minute I can't stand it but if you know if you smoke it that's your business and he said well then you don't mind I said it's your car I don't care what you do it's up to you and he said okay so he's smoking marijuana and we're going down the road and then he asked me what I did and I told him I'm, I'm in the pressure cleaning and I asked him what he did. He said he had a video store. 
that he owned and <clears throat> that he was on his way to Daytona. He's going to, he was telling me about his video store. He was on his way to Daytona to see some topless bars and if I knew any girls out there that'd be interested in pornography films, that he'd give two to three thousand dollars an hour for these sessions. And I told him, I don't know anybody. I'm into pressure cleaning and I, don't, I only got one girlfriend that I know and I know she wouldn't be interested, so sorry I can't help you there. And so we just talked about anything, politics, religion, talked about his store a lot. And still on the sex part, no, and then, but I just, I told him I don't know anybody constantly on that stuff. Finally arrived to Orlando, and he asked me if I wanted any beer instead of the mixed drink, because I had told him that I, I, haven't, I don't drink mixed drinks that much. And that I haven't had a mixed drink in about 10 years, it seems. Had you had any other alcohol that day? Yes, I drank, I, I drank beer in Fort Myers. I just came out of the office pub on my way back to Daytona. See, I had made around $300, and I only had about 250 or 60 left. I didn't want to look because I had to get back and get that apartment. That, okay. So, uh, what did you do once you got to Orlando? Okay, so when I got to Orlando, he went ahead and he bought a six pack for me. I think it was Bush. He asked me if I want a pack of I said, no, thank you. I've got some already. And then uh, he just got a little more gas and we went down the road. We got past Orlando and we had to stop, go to the bathroom. So we got out and went to the bathroom. Then I got back in. We were talking about, he was talking about his wife or his ex wife. I don't remember if he was married or not married or nothing, but he was talking about having problems with this lady that was, he was worried about losing his video store and he was losing his business. He's going to lose his house, he's going to lose his car, he's going to lose everything. And I don't know if he was married or not. Okay. Did you proposition him? No. Why not? Because I was too exhausted and everything. I had enough money and I just wanted to get home. All I wanted to do was get, get home. That's all I cared about. Okay. It was late. It was about 11.30 when he picked me up. Okay. Um, At night. So tell us what happened next. Okay. So anyway, then we stopped went to the bathroom. Then he kept asking me. He said, well, how come you understand married people so well? And I said, well, because I always talk to a lot of married people. He said, but I just can't, man, you're just like a psychologist or a counselor. I mean, you get, you're, you're a good listener, and you also give good advice. I said, well, thank you, you know. <laughs> so then he said, he said, do you mind if we just kind of stop somewhere and talk for a little while? I'd like to, you know, listen to your advice and stuff. You know, you're, you're helping me and stuff. And I said, well, I really want to get home. You know, I'm really tired and everything, and I've been hitchhiking for so long. And he said, he said, well, I mean, you know, just let's just go talk for an hour or something. I mean, I'll, I'll take you home. And I said, well, it is getting pretty late. If I, if I um, go home, the dog's going to, I don't have a key on me. If I go home, the dog's going to start barking. And the manager lives right next door, and I'm going to have to wake up time in the middle of the night. She has to go to work early in the morning. Cassie Del Mar, she was still working. So I said, well, I guess I wouldn't mind stopping and talking to you because I've got to pass a little time anyway. I'm going to have to wait till in the morning. I don't know what I'm going to do. I might even have to, you know, I mean, get a motel or something. I don't know what I'm going to do because it's too late for me to, I don't want Maggie to wake up the manager because he's already in the mood to kick us out. Okay. Okay. So um, then he said, well, okay, I'll give you a lift home. I said, well, great, then that's going to save me on taxi money, too. So he said, all right. He said, well, where do you live around? I said, well, you got to get off at US-1, and then you go to Granada. You take Granada over to A1A, and then you go north, and I live at the Ocean Shores, I think it was called, motel. So then um, he, we continued. We decided, okay, I'd stop. So you get off at, off a nine, uh, I-4 to 95, went north, got to US-1, got off, and he parked at a gas station. How long had it taken you to get to that point from when he first picked you up, do you know? It was about two and a half hours from okay. Daytona. Yeah, but when he first picked hours. you up until you got to this place where he stops to get the gas, the yeah. gas station, I guess. Yeah, I'd say two and a half hours. Okay. All right, so what happened after you saw that time? Okay, so then I, he said, well, where can we park? And I said, well, anywhere. You know, this is fine. 
You can park right there if you want to. And he said, no, I'm smoking pot, and I don't want to get busted. And plus, we got all this booze and stuff, and, you know, a patrol car comes by. And I said, well, if you go north up here, there's a whole lot of places there's up here. And there's an even Quail Run. They've got, like, a subdivision up there, and it's out near Benalla. It's really quiet up there if you want to go there. So he said, okay, let's go and check that place out. So... We went over there, and we were sitting there talking, and we talked for at least, I'd say, an hour and a half, two hours, just talking about everything. He still asked me about the pronos and all that stuff, and I said, no, no, no. Were you drinking? Yes. We, I was drinking beer. He was drinking his mixed drinks, and he was still smoking his pot. God, I couldn't believe he was smoking so much pot. I even asked him what pot it was eventually, and he said, Sensimilli. I, I've heard Sensimilli is some heavy pot, so I couldn't believe it. But he was handling it, and he was doing all right. And um, so then um, we were talking away and everything. And oh, okay, so he asked me. How come if you know married people, and you're, you know, you're so good at counseling and everything, if you know married people so well, you told me you're single and you have a roommate, how can you know so many married people? So then I finally told him, I said, that's, I guess I'm going to have to explain to you, Richard, because you're being so honest with me and I'm going to be honest with you. I said, I'm, I'm, a, hus I'm a hooker. I hustle for a living. And he said, hustle, you mean a sex? And I said, yeah, <laughs> this is a sex. Okay. So then he um, he said, well, God, I thought I was going to, we were going to get it on. I mean, eventually get it on together, but you don't do it free. You probably, you, you do it for money, right? I said, that's right. I do it for money. He said, so you don't, you don't do it for free, right? I said, no, I don't. This is my job. This is what I do for a living. Okay, so what would you do next after you had that conversation with him? Then he asked me how much I charged, and I said, said 30 for head, 35 straight, 40 for half and a half, 100 an hour. And he said, and I said, well, 100 an hour, I don't usually, you know, make the person, well, after an hour's up, I'll say, well, you got to give me another $100. If the guy's all right, you know, I'm just staying with him, we become friends. I just, thanks a lot, because I only want enough for rent and whatever. I don't care about, I'm not greedy. I don't care about making anymore. 100's fine, it's good enough for rent. That's cool. They're, they're now my friends. They're now my another client. And so that's what I told him. And um, and he said, um, so you, you mean tell me, if I gave you $100, we could spend a couple hours together. And I said, I guess so. I've been with you all this time. And plus, i got to wait for early, I've got to wait for dawn to come because I can't get home. And he said, all right, well, that sounds okay with me. He said, where's another place to go? Because we can't, we can't go here. I mean, it's wide open and everything. I said, well, if we go back near the gas stations, there's a campground there, and there's some little places that kind of pull off in the road if you want to go there. He said, okay. So we started cruising down there. And he fixed another drink, and he's smoking another pot. I mean, he had this thing, that this pipe that went into the marijuana, and it just twisted, and then you... I don't know what it's called, but that's what he was doing. He's, I couldn't believe how much he smoked. And I grabbed another beer, and I told him, I said, oh, my God, I forgot to tell you. We get, I use rubbers. It's mandatory. And he said, um, I said, we might have to stop the gas station and get some rubbers because I don't have any. He said, no, I got some. I said, oh, okay, that's good. So we started down the road, and... Finally, we got to the area. We couldn't see to, into the trail, so he asked me to get a flashlight out of the glove box. He said, I got a flashlight out of the glove box, and I'm looking around. We finally saw the trail. We went in. You couldn't go too far in at all. We were real close to, to the road, and cars were going by, and you could see. So he took a smaller, tinier flashlight out of the glove box and put it on the dash. Um, so they wouldn't see the dome light, because we were pretty close to the road. And then he said, well, I got an idea. How about if, if we both do this now, we both get undressed so I know that you won't skip out on my money. And I said, well, Richard, you know, I've never rolled a client in my life. I've never skipped out on anybody. But I can understand, I think, what you're saying because I told you I use rubbers. And I ain't going to do it without any rubbers with anybody. I don't care. No exception to the rule. And I'm precautious, so I guess you're being precautious, too. So, okay, this sounds fine with me. Is that unusual for you to take off all of your clothes first? No, because I used to do it all the time to let my clients know that I wasn't going to leave on them or anything, you know. So I was being honest with them. Hey, I'm all right. I'm a good 
you know, I'm cool. Okay. Um, so what happened after that? Did you take your clothes off? After you had that conversation with him? Well, he started, he told me he had to go back and get some rubbers out of the trunk. He said, don't worry, I'm going to go get some rubbers out of the trunk. I'm going to go get a sleeping bag and a yellow blanket. I mean, eventually I, it was yellow, a blanket. And he was going to put it in the front seat so he wouldn't get anything on the car seat. And so then he came back. Oh, well, wait a minute. I, yeah, I was undressing then. And I... I took my bag, I put it over near the hump here, and I started to take off my jeans and stuff. And by the time I was starting to take off my jeans and everything, he came back. I was half undressed, and I was putting my stuff in the back seat. And then I said to him, I helped rearrange the sleeping bag and everything on the seat. I went and took a leak and everything. And then I said to him, I said, well, this ain't fair. I said, we agreed upon both of us get nude. I'm the only one nude. And uh, he turned down the dome light, and he said, not bad. And I said, well, I don't know, because I've got a lot of stretch marks in the beer belly and everything. And you know, I think otherwise sometimes. And then he had this kind of smirk on his face, and he said, you'll do, and turns off the dome light. Was he mad? Huh? Was he mad at you for asking him to take his clothes off? Yeah, I didn't ask him to take his... I, I haven't asked him yet. I'm starting to now, but okay. I haven't even asked him yet. Okay. And that's the next thing I ask him. I said, okay. I said, well, Richard, why don't you take off your clothes and let's get started because it's cold in here. Because it was really cold outside. And he rolled down his window and he said, yeah, it is cold. I love cold weather. And all this wind, because it was windy out. All this wind's blowing in. So I said, hey, Richard, why don't you close the window, man? It's cold, man. And so he's ignoring me, and he said, he started acting like he was t uh, unbuckling his pants and unbuckling, I mean, unzipping his pants. Then he said, what if I do told you I don't have enough money? And like, I'm telling you, I don't really care. I was just doing this for a little, I was really just doing this past time, but I wasn't going to do it for free. i got to definitely have to make something out of it, because I've got somebody at home I can get my sex from if I need it, and I mean, you know what I'm saying. Okay. So, anyways, I said, how much do you have you got? And he said, I've only got a little for breakfast and some for gas. And I said, Richard, I said, no way. I said, I'm not here for my health. I said, we made an agreement. And I'm sorry, but I guess we're going to have to just call this off. You know, because he's acting like he don't have any money. So I turned around and I had my clothes on top of some boxes or something that were in the back, something there. I can't remember exactly, but they were on something. And I started to grab them. And as I started to grab my clothes, I saw him coming toward me. And then I was going to turn to look at him. And before I even got a chance to turn to look at him, he whipped a cord around my neck and pulled me toward him. Had you told him at that point, I'm, I'm not going to have sex with you? Had you said no? Yes, I told him, no way. I said, I'm not here for my health, no way. You know, we're going to have to call this off then. Tell us what happened after uh, you fell off the court right now. Okay, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm really nervous. And I'm really getting pretty shy and embarrassed, and this is hard for me, so... Just bear with me. Um, he put the cord around my neck. And he said, yes, you are, bitch. He said, you're going to do everything I tell you to do. And if you don't, I'll kill you right now. And I'll fuck you after. Like, just like the other sluts I've done. And, um, then he said, it doesn't matter to me. Their body, your body will still be warm for my huge cock. And he said, he was choking me and I was holding it like this. And he said, do you want to die, slut? And I just nodded no. 
And then he said, are you going you gonna to listen to everything I've got to say? Have you do? And I just nodded yes. And he told me to lay down on this car seat. So when he told me to lay down, he told me to give me my hands. And so I gave him my, I had to lift up my hands like this and he tied my hands and he tied me to the steering wheel. Where is he in, in relation to you at this point? He's sitting in the driver's seat. Is he behind you? I'm laid down like this with my feet near the window. Okay. And Okay. And then what happened? Then he got out of the car. He told me to slide up and get comfortable because he's going to see too much meat he can pound in my ass. So he walked around from the driver's seat to the passenger side. And opened the door, he started to undress. And he's throwing his clothes on the floor. And this is very embarrassing for me. So he got in, and then he told, lifted my legs all the way up. Where my feet are near the window. Okay, what happened next? Then he he began to start having uh, anal sex. Okay. And he's doing this very violent manner, movement. And then he, I don't know, if he came or uh, um, climax. I, I talk street talk, so, so I don't know if he did that. <clears throat> and he violently took himself out and violently put himself in my vagina. Were you saying anything to him at that point? No, I was crying my brains out. Okay. Was he saying anything to you? Yes, he was saying that he loved to hear me, the pain, that when I moaned, and he loved to hear my crying, and it turned him on. Okay, then what happened? Then he, well, he pretty much bruised, like, my cervix and all, and everything else. He got off. He had bruised my ribs and everything else. And he got off. And he got up, took his clothes, walked over to the driver's side. And then so he took he put his clothes on the hood of the car. He had the door open. Now, went and got the ignition out of the car, went into the trunk and got something out of the trunk, and he brought it back, and it was a red cooler and a blue tote bag. So, anyway, in this red cooler was two liter bottles. I think they were Pepsi. I don't know, but they were two big bottles full of water, I think. The tote bag, had a maroon large towel, something like a white or yellow towel. Had I was turning my head to see what he was doing when I was tied to the steering wheel and it was straining my neck, so sometimes I had to put my head back down because I couldn't turn it all the way to see what he was doing. And I, at one time I asked him, I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm full of surprises, honey, for you tonight. And I turned my head, kept watching, and the dome light was on, so this is how I saw what was coming out of the bag. And then there was a bar of soap, toothbrush, rubbing alcohol, and a bottle of glycine. So then he uh, 
he took the bottle of rubbing alcohol and the bottle of ice and he put it in front of my face and he said, this is what this is. And I'm like, what? You know, and he takes the visine bottle and he puts it on the front of the dash and he takes the rubbing alcohol and puts it with his other stuff. And this guy begins to take a bath because he had blood all over his penis and with some other jazz, which I don't think I should say. Okay. By taking a bath, do you mean he was cleaning himself? He began to take a bath using this water in the bottle. He put rubbing alcohol, I guess. I don't know if it was rubbing alcohol or what, but later he just poured it all over himself and he told, he was saying that the last sluts he had, he, he thought were full of diseases and he always had to clean himself. Okay, what happened next? Okay. So he's cleaned himself, blowing me away. And I said to myself, I think this guy is going to kill me. He's going to get rid of me. Or he's, I don't know what he's going to do, dissect me or something. I don't know what he's got in this bag. Like, he's strange. He is totally weird. So he uh, gets every, everything. He gets done cleaning. He puts his clothes back on. He gets the cooler, brings it back to the trunk, puts in, puts everything in the tote bag, leaves it there. He goes around the passenger side. He grabs a bottle of ice from the dashboard. He goes around the passenger side. And he says, this is one of my surprises. Oh, Lord, my ears are ringing. And I'm dizzy a little. Put your head down for a second. We can wait. Hmm. OK. All right, so. Uh, takes the visine and he lifts up my legs and he puts what turns out to be rubbing alcohol in the visine bottle and he sticks some up my rectum area with it. And that really hurt really bad because he tore me up for a while. And then I put some in my vagina, which really hurt bad. And then he walked around to the back to driver's seat side and he pulled my nose open like this. Pulled them open and he squirt rubbing alcohol down my nose. And he said, I'm saving your eyes for the grand finale. And he put the visine back on the dash. And I was really pissed. I was just, I didn't care. I was yelling at him and everything else. He was laughing away, saying, that's what I want to hear. I heard you start crying and all that pain. So, then he... Put it there, and there's a few more items on the car. I put it back in the tote bag. Then he put the tote bag back in the trunk. Closed the trunk. Came back, he had this gray radio, a square gray radio, two speakers on it. Went into the back of the seat, got the gray radio. They went around the passenger side, made a drink, because he couldn't get through with me tied to the steering wheel. And then he walked back to the driver's side and went underneath the seat and got his marijuana, got his cigarettes off the dash, and I guess he walked over to the front of the car because I couldn't see where he was. And I felt the car move, and he's just sitting there, and he cranks up the radio. The window is still open in the car. I'm freezing to death. And so he's just 
sitting out there listening to the radio and I'm thinking this guy is thinking how he's going to kill me. So I'm trying desperately to get off untied from the steering wheel. I tried 101 times and finally even, he even said, I can feel you moving in there, don't worry, you ain't going to get untied unless I untie you. I didn't care. I kept trying and kept moving my body up like this and pulling and pulling. <sighs> so finally he came back. After about an hour, it must have been an hour or so, it seemed like the longest time. And he said, it's, finally the cold weather got to me. Do you believe it? I'm getting in. So... I'm thinking, how is he going to get in? I'm here, tied to the steering wheel. How can he get in? And he said, I'm going to untie you from the steering wheel. You better be a good girl. I'll kill you. He said, so he untied me from the steering wheel. He untied me and put the rope around my neck and held it like a leash around my neck. He told me to move over so he could move in. So he moved over. I mean, I moved over, and he moved in, and then closed the door, and he's still saying all kinds of jazz about what he wants to do. So then he told me to turn toward him, lay down, and spread my legs. He has all of his clothes on. I guess he's just going to sip himself. I don't know. Were you saying anything to him, Lee? I didn't say nothing. I was scared. Okay, so then what happened? I may have said something sardonic to him, like, why did you just take out your clothes on? Why don't you take your clothes off like you did before? So, I don't know. I don't recall. I may have. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. It's too long ago. It took me long. It was hard enough for me to remember these blackouts because this is a blackout situation that I had to remember. So I don't recall every incident, that every word and all that. That's hard for me to remember. I'm trying to hard my best to even remember everything he did say. Okay, just tell us what you do remember. Okay, good. Okay, so yeah, he had me turn and he wanted to start having sex with me. And he had the rope, I mean, not the rope, it was a, I later learned it was jacks to a stereo, but it was cut. Where there's only one jack, and it says how I found out it was jacks to a, a stereo or something, or TV or something, it was round, gray. So he had, he was holding me like this, like reins. <laughs> That's when I said, I'm going to grab this. He grabbed it, he came right out of his hand, I flung it in the back seat. Did you say, did you know I'm going to grab this? Or did you no, my mind. Okay. I said, grab that, grab it now, you know, do something, you got to fight. I, I thought to myself, i got to fight, I'm going to die. This guy is going to play with me and play with me, and then he's going to kill me. He's already said he's going to kill me. He's, he's already said he killed other girls. i got to fight. I just got to fight for my life. Plus, now I'm, I was close to the area where my, my bag was, where my gun was. Okay, where, where was your, your bag? My bag was near the hump because I had first had it in the right side, but I had to move it because it was in the way for me to get my jeans off. And so I kind of moved it almost on the hump. Actually, it was almost on the hump. I pushed it all, all the way over so I could get room to move and change. Okay, so what happened next? So then, oh, he, I grabbed it, flung it. Yeah, he takes his left arm, he choked him, and I grabbed my, I just, I can't. He just grabbed me like this, and I grabbed my hand up like this, and kept it away. He slapped me really hard in the face and I and he started choking me but I grabbed his right or left arm, right arm, right arm, yes. And I kept it up and I took got upward with my feet 
and I pushed him back and he kind of quit struggling and just got up on his knees and said, you're going to be a lot of fun. And while he was saying that, I jumped up real fast and I spit in his face. And he said, you're a dead bitch, you're dead. And he's wiping his eyes. And I laid down real quick and I grabbed my bag. And he was starting to come for, for me. And I grabbed my bag and threw, whipped my pistol out toward him. And he was coming toward me with his right arm, I believe. And I shot immediately. And I think I shot twice, as fast as I could. And then what'd you do? And he started coming at me again. And I shot. He stopped. I hurried, kind of pushed him away from me. And he kind of sat up on the driver's seat. I hurried, opened the passenger door, ran around the driver's side, opened the door real fast, looked at him, and he started to come out. And I said, don't come out. Don't come near me. I'll shoot. I'll have to shoot you again or something like that. Don't make me have to shoot you again or something like that. He just started coming at me, and I shot. And I don't know where I shot him. I just shot him. And he fell on the ground. And then I pulled him away from the car. You want to hear the rest? What happened? What happened after you shot him the last time? I stood there and looked at him and thought, what I'm going to do with the car? And I said, well, i got to drag him away from the car because he's near the car. I'm going to run him over if I don't move him. So I dragged him away. I got back in the car totally nude. I went to reach for the keys and the ignition to start up. It wasn't there. So I ran back to him. I looked in his pockets for his keys, got his keys. Went back to the car, started it up, backed up. Headlights, I turned him on. I turned him on, looking at his body. I went back to him, checked his pulse. He was dead. I saw a carpet in front of him because of the headlights. I said, I don't want the birds to be picking at his body. So I grabbed the carpet and I put it over him. Jumped in the car, backed out, took off nude, went back to Quail Run. Lee, did you take anything else off of him when you went into his pockets other than the car keys? No. So you went back to Quail Run? Yes. Why did you go back over to Quail Run? Because I was totally nude and I had to get dressed. And I also had to get my senses together. I was totally crying, shaking, totally scared out of my mind. And I had to change. I had to get on my clothes and everything. And then when I got there, I realized that I had a little bit of blood on me and stuff. So I went into the trunk and got out the stuff he took out. And I started cleaning myself like he did. And then I put my clothes back on. And then I took all the stuff that was in the car and threw it on the floorboard. And I took all my stuff and put it on the seat and just sat there wondering what to do, drinking a beer and thinking, what am I going to do? I just didn't know what I was going to do. And I said, I'm going to have to lay low. I don't know what I'm going to do, man. I can't get out. I, I'm going to have to drop this car off, whatever. When I saw the radar detector, I said, I'll keep it to pawn it off for food or whatever, because I'm not going to be able to get out on the road now. I'm scared. They're going to find his body. I've got to go and hurry up and dump this car. What time, the, what time is it by this time? This is, I, I remember when I was throwing stuff out. I was throwing a bunch of stuff out in the woods. Just kept on throwing. So now in Quail Run, I drove to another area. I stopped again and I threw a bunch of stuff out in the woods. And I noticed his watch and I checked it. It was 6.30 in the morning. When, when do you uh, last remember, in terms of time, that, that he was alive? I don't know how long. See, I didn't know what time it was. All I knew is he was out there sitting in the car on the hood for about an hour, and I never, never got to know what time it was. Okay. All right, so what did you do after that, after you noticed what time it was? 
I said, I've got to hurry up and get back to Ty. I'm gonna. I'm tired. I'm beat up. I'm hurting all over. My crotch hurts. My vagina hurts. My nose hurts. I'm freaking out. I've got to go take a shower. I mean, these are the things that are going through my mind, you know, as I'm sitting there. I've got to get. I got. I got to hurry up and get rid of this car. Go back home. Take a shower. Hurry up and get this car. I was going to take it to the car wash, wash it, and go drop it off somewhere to get rid of all my prints. I'm so scared now because I just said I have to kill this guy. Okay. And I don't know what to do. What did you do? Well, I went back home. And when I got home, I got, my plan was to go to the car wash, wash the car off and everything else to get rid of it. But when I got there, Maggie, my dog Maggie, and my cat Tyler... <laughs> Maggie tore the chair all to shreds. She chews carpets too, and she chewed the carpet all to shreds, tore the curtains and the blinds all up. So I, when I knocked on the door and Ty opened the door for me, and I saw this, I said, what is this? And she said, I don't know, Maggie and Tyler just got crazy. Why well, I, I was at work, I said, oh my God. And I just realized, you know, that I've got this guy's car. The man, I, we're supposed to move that day. It's it, it, totally a coincidence that we were moving that day. We had three people there who were going to move us at the, around 5 o'clock after Ty got out. And I said, man, if the manager sees this, he's going to call the cops. He's going to have the cops here. I've got the car here, everything. I've got to get rid of the car and everything. So I said... Our, I, all the boxes were, everything was ready to move. And I said, let's, let's move now. I've got, a guy loaned me a car like that, I said to her. And I said, he's waiting at a motel. He's going to let us keep it for just a couple hours to move. I just said it like that. And I told her to call Jane and tell her we're coming over. Just to hurry up and get out of that room because it was totally destroyed. And then she said, what are those hickeys on your neck? And I said, what are you talking about? And so I walked into the bathroom and I looked and I said, Oh, no, I must have slapped a mosquito real hard or something. I was trying to ignore it, and she kept asking me. She said, I told you, don't you ever go out there with those hickeys out? I mean, get a hickey out there uh, when you're out in the road. And I told her, I said, they're not hickeys. Don't worry. I just slapped a mosquito too hard or something. I don't know what it is. And then we just, that was the end of that. And then we hurried up and got the stuff in, and we just left. What did you finally do with uh, Richard Mallory's car? Okay, we got to the new apartment. I hurried up. We put our stuff in. Ty had to hurry up and go to work. I had to go right back to the motel. She had to pick up the moped. My, tw I think it was 12 speed. My 12 speed was there too. The moped and 12 speed would work together. I decided to put the 12 speed in the back of the trunk. And she took the moped, went to work. I went to the car wash, hurried up and washed the car, cleaned it out. Then I went down John Anderson, went up to a place uh, to park it, and I took the bicycle out, and I was going to ride home. And I was cleaning the car out to make sure about Prince. I forgot the glove box, and that's where his, because I found his wallet underneath the seat, and I went through it to find out who he, if he really was Richard or what his name was in that and a bunch of credit cards and everything else. And I just threw it in the glove box, and as I was wiping down, I remember the glove, I opened up, and I said, oh, oh, God, I forgot to throw this out. So I went in the back of the car, I dug a hole, and I put it there, and then I found this darn vodka bottle was underneath the seat, and a couple more glasses were underneath the seat that I didn't notice. So I took them out, I put them in, so I started checking underneath the seat really good to get everything, and I was finding, like, like pens and nice fun little business cards and stuff, and I was just throwing them. I didn't really know what I was doing. When I got done burying the wallet and the glass and the, the vodka bottle in it and the glass and stuff, the stuff else that I was finding in the car, I was just throwing it. I didn't even, you know, just, just throwing the stuff out. Which, see, I didn't know what I was doing here. I was doing this to bury for prints to make sure my prints were on there, and then I was throwing stuff out, so I didn't have. Did you take anything out of uh, Richard Bauer's wallet when you were going through it? Well, he only had about $38 or 42 or 48 something like that. It wasn't very much money. Did you take it? Yes. Did you take any credit cards? No. What did you do after you finished throwing things into the woods? And I got on my bicycle, I started riding, and I just threw the keys. 
into the into somebody's yard or something. It was like a bush or something. I just threw them. And went back home. That's it. I just went home. Lee, did you make it clear to men that picked you up that you would not have sex with them without money? Well, I had two guys had sex with me without money once, and I didn't do anything to them, and I had my gun with me. And they just never used a weapon on me. They never hurt me. They weren't really physical or anything on me. They just didn't want me to go unless they had sex. But uh, basically, I told them, you know, I don't do it without money. so hard that the blood was running to my head and spots were before my eyes. I couldn't talk. All I could do was help. I was trying to get the cord not to be. Okay. 